Welcome to part 7 of the Genesis story. I've entitled this Family Tragedy and we're going to be looking at chapter 4 through to the beginning of chapter 6 in the book of Genesis. Before we start let's just look back and see where we've got to in the previous presentations. There's a fundamental problem with humanity. We want to be independent of God, to do it our own way, to take our own decisions. We want moral autonomy. We want to decide what's right and wrong for ourselves. Because of this, the whole creation suffers. We were created to look after God's world. And it suffers because we're not fulfilling the true purpose that God intended. So everything is a little bit out of joint because of our decision, our rebellion to declare ourselves as independent of God. God breathed into human beings and he made a new kind of being. God imparted spiritual life to us. We are created in his image and likeness. We are in a sense able to do what God does and to be what God is. This wonderful picture of creation coming up from the animals. We arrived at the human level, but then we were given a moral and a spiritual freedom. God breathed into us spiritual life. We have self-consciousness, the capacity to create, doing what God does. The capacity to love, being what God is. And this is a kind of new level of being that marks us out as human beings. That's the wonderful story of creation that the author to the book of Genesis has pictured for us. We are both like the animals, but also very different from the animals in God's purpose and plan. And one of the unique marks of being human is simply that it involves choice. We have a spirituality. We are aware of that which is beyond ourselves. That's the spiritual life that God has placed within humanity. But that means choice. Because we are aware, it gives us choice. We can go left. We can go right. We have to take decisions. We took the wrong decision. And Genesis 4 onwards shows the outcomes of human rebellion, what it leads to, what can happen. The outcomes of human choices, our decisions. But it also shows that God hasn't written us off. We deserve to be written off our rebellion, but God hasn't written us off. And his grace, he does for us what we don't deserve. He does for us what we cannot do for ourselves. We are capable of choosing the good or the bad. We're capable of the most amazing things. Humanity has achieved the most remarkable things. But we're also capable of committing the most terrible atrocities. That is part of choice. And it's inevitability of being spiritual. We come now to the story of Cain and Abel. Now remember Adam and Eve. They're just ordinary Hebrew words. Adam, man or mankind. Hawe, bringer of life. And we have the word for Lord, God, Yahweh, the self-existent one, the one who exists in relationship. Hebrew words carrying meaning, sometimes translated into proper nouns in our English Bibles. Now here we have a family line. And the writer to the Genesis emphasises so often the family lines of those that are not the key person. He does that first. And then the author moves on to those who are the key people in God's purposes and plans. Of course Cain killed Abel, so there's no family line of Abel. 
but there is a family line of Cain. And if we look at these people as they're pictured in this chapter, we have a picture of people who built homes. Now that's a big move from the nomadic kind of lifestyle, moving around and living under animal skins as tents. There's the beginning of husbandry, looking after animals and farming. There's also nomad nomadic no mobility because the land was fairly desert and you had to move around a bit. But there's also the creative arts and technology. These start, despite the family line of Cain not being the key family line, despite all that Cain did in committing murder, and some of his descendants did some pretty horrendous things, particularly Lamech near the bottom. Nonetheless, God did not remove his image and likeness from them. They were still spiritually aware. They were still capable of enormous creativity. But what was wrong with Cain's offering? Why did it differ from Abel's? Well, Abel offered the best. Now that's the key thing, the best. But then why did Cain kill Abel? Your younger brother offers the best. It's accepted, so Cain shows jealousy and resentment. Oh, how this is the true story of humanity. We compare ourselves one to the other. We want to be the best. We want to be accepted and popular. And we don't get it. That's what happens. And sometimes it can lead to murder. There were consequences for Cain. And what God said to him was this. If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. Not easy to see exactly what the writer was meaning by that. So let's look at that in a little bit more detail. When we pull apart the words in the original, here is a suggestion of a way of interpreting it. Is there not forgiveness of sin if you do well? If you do not do well, the croucher, a demon, is at your door. Its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. Yes, we humans rebel, we make mistakes, we do some terrible things, but God will still forgive. Forgiveness and the door of forgiveness is not shut even to Cain. But Cain is reminded, if he won't go that way, there are consequences. If he chooses that rebellion, if he chooses to go away from God and to do things that are against God's purposes, there's someone waiting to catch him out and to make life misery. And the croucher, of course, is a noun in the original. It's understood from the Hebrew words as demons or a demon. An evil angel from Satan. That's all it is. Nothing to be frightened about. But when we choose to rebel, we open the door to Satan's evil angels. We have the power to resist. But if we desire to do it our way and to rebel... We open the door for these evil angels to have a go at us and to pull us down even further. There's a great principle in this. We have responsibility for our behaviour. We can't pass the buck to anyone else. Yes, forgiveness is possible, but we hold responsibility. And when we choose the wrong ways, Satan and his demonic hosts are ready to lead us astray. We can't blame them because we've chosen that way. They want to control us. They want to mess up our lives. They want to make our lives miserable. What we've got to do is resist them. Now, there's enormously deep principles simply in that one set of commands. Principles that are worked out in the New Testament. Human moral responsibility. We can't avoid it. And it shows in how we do things, how we behave, and the way we treat other people, because that's the true mark of good behaviour. Now, when we fail, God is always there to forgive. If we seek that forgiveness and admit the failure, 
But the demonic, the angels of Satan, are waiting there. And if we choose not to seek forgiveness, if we choose not to recognise what we've done wrong, if we rationalise it away, they're just waiting to take control and mess up our lives. And we should resist them. That's the picture that's given here for us. We are responsible. The de demons can't get at us just by their choice. They get at us only when we choose, when we choose to rebel. They can be resisted by our choice and we can't blame the demonic for the things we do wrong. It is our decision, our choice. That's the point that God is making to Cain in this story. When we rebel, then God kind of moves himself away from us and we're not so aware of him. We become a restless wanderer. This is what happened to Cain. And very often this shows with a kind of irrational fear of others. How true to life this picture is, the story of Cain. We're no longer aware of God. We don't seem to quite fit. We've got this restlessness. And we're always looking over our shoulder in fear of others. It's an alienation from God and it leads to fear of others. That is a true picture and a reality described for us in this story in the life of Cain. You could sum up the story of humanity in two directions. We're capable of the most amazing creativity. Think of the things humans have invented, even in the last century or two. The achievements that humans have made in all forms and realms of life. Think too of the utter depravity that we humans are capable of. The way we treat each other, sadly still happening in some parts of the world. And this often leads to brutal violence. We're a mixed up story. We're animals. But God has breathed in his life into us. We're made in his image and his likeness. We can do what God does in the great creative achievements. We're spiritually sensitive. And as soon as we're spiritual, we have choice. And we humans, humans choose to rebel. And sometimes it leads to the most horrendous behaviour. Now let's move to the line of Seth, the youngest brother. We've got again the three brothers there. And many of these names don't mean very much to us. Occasionally we come across one that rings a bell. Enoch, Methuselah, and then Noah, perhaps the most famous in the line. But the author here has pictured these. Now remember these lists of names aren't necessarily father, son, father, son. They're just ancestors. And there can be gaps. That's the way they did it in those days. They didn't work with a Western mindset. It's an ancestry. And these are just some of the key names in the family line of Seth. Many of the names are just ordinary Hebrew words with meanings. I've put down some of the meanings here. Remember that Adam, with a capital A, that's and his decision of translators. Because the word doesn't have a capital. It just means man or mankind. And that includes women. You can see some of the names down there and some of the meanings. And you can see these amazing ages when they died. We've got to be very cautious of this because we don't know how they use number. So we don't know just quite what these numbers mean. 
There's a problem with these lifespans. There's no evidence whatsoever that people lived these huge lifespans anything further back in history. So we've got to address that issue and try and see what it means. The word father can just mean ancestor. So it's a selective family line. Adam just means man or mankind. If you look at two other versions of the Old Testament, the ages that they give for these people varies in places. So I don't think the numbers have any great significance. One of the things that is important is that there are 10 generations listed. Now the author to Genesis has got enormous amount of patterns, both in language and in number. 10 generations is selected, it's symbolic. So you can't add up the ages, ages. and it won't match history or archaeology because these are selective. Selected descendants from Adam. And as I said, there's no evidence whatsoever that suggests that human beings at some stage lived for these great ages. Stop for a minute, people couldn't read or write. They didn't have clocks and watches. They didn't have calendars. How on earth could they get ages? How did they calculate them? They had seasons of a sort, but we don't even know if they were using that. We simply don't know. So we've got to be cautious in interpreting these numbers. Just to add to the confusion, in the Hebrew language, there are no numbers. Like many ancient languages, you just used letters, and that opens up to possible misinterpretation, because we're not always quite sure how they're using it. That's also a third problem. Sometimes a name can represent a clan rather than an individual, a family a group of people. So it might be a lifespan of clan grouping. That is perfectly possible. You see, the point of the author is nothing to do with that. We don't have to worry about these ages. What the author is stressing is that family lines, and he's building steadily towards the family that led to a man called Abram, or Abraham, who is the focal point of God reaching to humanity with something new and different and wonderful. That's his purpose. And he's showing family lines and then just screening them out. But the line of Seth is the one that is, leads eventually to the family of Abram. That's the point he's making. And there's a message here. People multiplied. Populations weren't huge at the time. They moved around. There was plenty of space. And they all died. That's the point the author was making. There's one exception, Enoch, who just walked with God and passed from this life to eternity. Death comes. If you look at Lamech, who's seventh in the line from Cain, he's described as an utterly violent man. He just took what he wanted and he killed when he wanted. But look at Enoch, the seventh from Seth. Enjoyed fellowship with God and death didn't touch him. You see, there's pattern in the sequences, patterns in the numbers. The, the writer has chosen these things to make points, clever points, clear points, important points. We can't read into this by literally looking at the numbers. Because these two people give you two contrasts as possibilities for humanity. Two ways that humanity could go, and humanity has gone these two ways. Chapter 6 is even more complex. When human beings began to increase in number on the earth and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of humans were beautiful, and they married any of them they chose. Then the Lord said, My spirit will not contend with humans forever, for they are mortal. Their days will be a hundred and twenty years. The Nephilim were on earth in those days and also afterward, when the sons of God went to the daughters of humans and had children by them. They were the heroes of old. Men of renown. Now your reaction just hearing that is, what on earth is the author trying to say? We have to recognise that in that text, 
the writer has chosen language extremely carefully. As a lot of wordplay, we'd call it a pun in our language today. Now that's because stories were not written down. They were told, probably around a campfire in the evening. And if you play with words and you have patterns with numbers, people remember the story. That's the point of what the author is doing. The word Lord there is Yahweh, the self-existent God, the God of relationship. Relationship within himself, relationship with humans. The word Adam is used four times there. None of them translated with a proper name. Human beings, men and women, plural. Humans, humans, humans. That's the normal use of the word. And again, we need caution in interpreting it. But the word there for men is different. It talks about men in the sense of being mortal. That's the emphasis of that word. Sons of God. I put up the Hebrew, Benny Elohim. Sons of God. What does this mean? We're going to look at that in a moment or two. And then Nephilim. Now that word is put in a capital in our English versions, an ordinary Hebrew word, possibly meaning giants or people of large stature. Interesting thought. There's no evidence that there were giants and huge people that ever existed. There's no evidence from fossils or graves anywhere. The tallest human that's ever lived seems to be nearer nine foot tall. But when we're that tall, our bodies weren't really designed to cope with it. But just what is that word meaning? People who were important, had a big impact, maybe. That's all possible. The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth. That every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. The Lord regretted that he had made human beings on the earth and his heart was deeply troubled. So the Lord said, I will wipe from the face of the earth the human race I have created. And with them the animals, the birds and the creatures that move along the ground. For I regret that I have made them. But Noah found favour in the eyes of the Lord. Again we have the use of the word Yahweh, a God of relationship. And again, the word Adam. Translated human race, human beings, or even them, to make the English sound smooth. But let's go back and look at this phrase, son of, because it's going to give us a help to understand what this passage means. Son of in the Old Testament. I'm not going to look at it in the New Testament, just in the Old Testament. Now the, the phrase really means carrying the essence of, embodying the heart of, having the essential quality of. In other words, a son of something means that you're like the something, you're carrying the essence of it. That's the ordinary meaning of that phrase. Just carry that in mind. Angels are described as sons of God. You see, angels carry the essence of God because they are spiritual beings. Oh yes, they're created by God, but they have a spiritual existence. They don't have a physical existence. They're the servants of God to serve mankind, as the New Testament teaches us. Human race is sometimes described as the son of God because we are made in the image and likeness of God. In other words, we carry something of the essence of our creator. Interesting thought. Sometimes it's specific humans or specific groups of humans. And that occurs with Israel, the nation of Israel, described in Exodus as the firstborn son of God implying that other groups are going to be sons as well. But they're the firstborn. Because in a way, they were reflecting and carrying something of the essence of God himself. And then in one psalm in Isaiah and elsewhere, the picture of someone who was going to come. He'd be called a son or a son of God because the nature of God, the very essence of God, the totality of God would rest strongly on him. Now we know, looking back, that the writers are speaking of Jesus. But that gives us a clue of this phrase, son of. It means carrying the essence of. So what does it mean here, son of God? 
As is the writer in Genesis talking about angels? The coming Messiah. The dynasty of David, because David was called the son of God. Or the nation of Israel. Now we can rule out three of these right away. Can't possibly refer to the coming Messiah. The dynasty of David was a long way into the future and the nation of Israel hadn't come into being. And we talked about the nation of Israel being firstborn, implying that the rest of humanity can also be called sons of God. Two possibilities. We've got to look at the angel explanation. Either there are fallen angels, we call them in New Testament terms demons, servants of Satan, disguised as human males, they married and fathered children by human women. Now, in that, angels don't have physical bodies. I'm just slightly hesitant about that, and I think that's slightly more likely. I'm going to suggest that fallen angels entered human males. Now, they can't just enter any human male, or indeed they can't enter any human being. It's only when we deliberately rebel against God and make choices that they're hovering at the door. Remember the story of Cain? Hovering there to hassle us and maybe enter us. So human males, perhaps powerful human males, rulers, the ruling class, and they married. There's no suggestion in the Hebrew that they just took women and raped them. They married them. But in those days, a man could have several wives. So powerful men took attractive women, and these men, living godless lives, have been infiltrated by the demonic, and they fathered children by the human women. And here we have the properties of Satan now entering the human race. No wonder humanity was entering a period of utter depravity. That's the picture that's given. Wickedness, all intensive and per all pervasive, every part of life being infected. There's no answer to human wickedness. It doesn't work by education or politics or self-effort. But God cares. And he saw the human race being perverted and destroyed by satanic infiltration. And he wants to put it right. The word justice really means God putting it right. God wants to put right the, the results of human evil. Our rebellion has consequences just as night follows day. We think we can get away with it. But there are inevitable consequences. Don't think of them as just some sort of punishment. They are just inevitable consequences. And the satanic hosts had infiltrated humanity. So God takes a decision. The human race, the spirit empowerment that God breathed into us, when we get to the death, that's removed from us. Immortality is gone. He sets the life at 120 years. Now that is just three times 40. 40 is a symbol, symbolic or idiomatic language meaning a generation when it refers to years. So life is set at three generations and if you look at life spans then and now typically three generations is a normal pattern. And there is an end called death. You see we lost our right to immortality in the rebellion described in the Garden of Eden. We rebelled and chose to run our own lives and do it our own way. Immortality, which was there, is God. Only God can restore it. And thank God there is a way that he does restore it for us if we so choose to go that way. But that's another story. You see, we chose the way of rebellion, a way of independence, and we lost that guarantee. There's the picture of chapter 6. The rebellion in the garden has led to all sorts of disastrous outcomes. Our true humanity rests on God having breathed into us an implanted divine nature that shows in two ways. God made us in his image and likeness. We can in a measure do what God does. God the great creator the one thing that marks out humans is our creativity. 
and our likeness is seen in we are what God is. We have a spiritual capacity and specifically we have a capacity to love. Now love is not an emotional sentimental word. When we say God loves us it means that his agenda is our benefit. He just wants the best for us. When we love each other our agenda is we want the best for the other person. In this sense we are the sons of God. It's genuine sonship. We are children, sons and daughters of the Most High God. But in our rebellion, we've messed up. And our life is restricted. Death is the end. The immortality has been lost. Yes, it can be restored through what Jesus has done. But the purpose of man's existence has gone. That's the picture of chapter 6. Let's try and bring it together. What we have to remember is that the author has selectively traced family lines. Very, very important in the culture of that day to trace your family line, selectively. But he's really interested in the man Abram. Because Abram was the key to restoring humanity's immortality. There were three brothers, but two effectively disappear. Yes, there was a family line of Cain, and then it just vanishes. Abel was murdered. But the family line of Seth leads on to Noah, which then leads on eventually to Abram. We're capable of the most amazing creative achievements. Even though we're rebellious, there's no monopoly in creativity. All human beings of all religions, all classes, all colours and shapes and sizes, men and women, we're capable of that enormous creativity, despite our rebellion. But at the same time, satanic infiltration, the sons of God, the angelic hosts of evil, Satan's angels, infiltrated humanity, and humanity started to collapse into total moral depravity. That's the story of humanity. We're a strange mixture. Two directions. From the greatest and the highest to the utterly depraved and to the utterly terrible. God hasn't written us off despite our rebellion. He hasn't removed our capacity to be creative or our sense of the spiritual. But he longs for us to be restored to his way and to his purpose. We carry responsibility for how we behave. We can't pass the buck and blame God. We can't blame each other. We can't blame Satan and his demonic hosts. We carry responsibility because we chose to run our lives independently of God. There are inevitable consequences. And in this story, we see in the life of Cain and what he did. And then in the total moral breakdown of society, some of the consequences of decisions that were taken. It's been a tough presentation and a hard story, but it's re realistic. We're going to move in the next presentation to look at how the depravity was resolved and God's rescue of humanity.